among such distinguished panelists and an engaged audience, all united by a common purpose, transforming towards a sustainable future for agriculture. Agriculture sits at the heart of some of the most critical challenges we face globally, from feeding a rapidly growing population to serving our natural resources and combating climate change. Yet it also holds to the keys to the solution. Today we stand on the brink of a transformational era in agriculture driven by innovation, technology, and a shared commitment to sustainability. Our panel today brings together a diverse group of leaders who are at the forefront of this transformation. We'll start with Jamie Ridgely, Product and Operations of Habitare, sitting second, whose cutting edge use of AI and remote sensing is reshaping our understanding of and management of croplands. Um, Sumita Salvador is Senior Associate Corporate Development in Food and Agriculture at S2G Ventures, a venture capital firm that is fueling innovation in food and agriculture through strategic investments. Alexei Rostovchov, sorry Alexei, <laughs> told you I'd do that. Um, head of Labs and Sustainability Solutions, John Deere, and it's an iconic name in agricultural equipment, a big part of my life and uh, leading the charge in integrating sustainability in the farming operations. And finally, Charlie Forsman, Ecosystems Impact Lead with Bayer, which is pioneering biotech solutions to help farmers produce more with less. And so we'll start with Charlie, you're on the end, and uh, each of the panelists will give a little bit of a background and then we'll move into some Q&A. Hello, and thanks for having me. My name's Charlie Forsman. I'm with the sustainability team with Bayer Crop Science. Between Monsanto and Bayer, I've got about 20 years of experience in industry. I started my career as a plant breeder, um, worked in various commercial and technology roles, and the last five years I've been working in the sustainability space. Awesome, hi everyone. I'm Sumita Salvador. I am a senior associate at S2G Ventures focused on corporate development. And at S2G Ventures, we invest in three key sustainability transitions. So food and agriculture, oceans and seafood, and clean energy. And you heard a little bit about venture capital earlier, so we do venture capital, we also do growth equity, and we think a little bit about structured financing and project finance as well. Um, John, do you want me to dive in a bit further? Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So. Um, for in, terms, in terms of our food and agriculture portfolio, we really invest across the entire food and ag value chain. So everything from upstream technologies on farm and production, we invest in the middle of the supply chain, things like ingredients, packaging, supply chain optimization, and we also invest all the way to end consumer brands. Um, but what really underpins our thesis and why I'm so excited about this panel today is really thinking about how do we invest in companies that are focused on better outcomes for the environment, for sustainability, um, as well as for human health? Um, and so when we think about um, what that looks like for us in food and agriculture, we invest about a billion dollars in 65 portfolio companies uh, kind of across those spaces. And so in terms of sustainability for food and ag specifically, a few areas that we're really excited about are um, you know, new types of inputs. So how do we think about more sustainable ways to produce um, crop nutrition and crop protection products, things like biologics, RNA-based technologies, um, epigenetics. We're also really excited about the potential for digital agriculture, which of course we've talked a lot about, but how do we find new data sets, whether it's in-field um, ground truth data or new approaches to soil testing, um, soil sampling that can really unlock um, new practices and uh, measurement and verification of carbon. And then, which I'm sure you'll also talk more about, um, and then we're also really excited about some of the more, um, I'll say, enabling technologies. So things like better approaches or more novel approaches to financing and risk management. I think having been in the ag tech space for a long time, we really have seen a lot of burden placed on growers to bear the cost of some of these transitions to sustainability. And we really feel like that's um, you know, not fair and something that the industry needs to work towards to provide better solutions for them. Um, so happy to dive in further um, later on in some of the challenges and opportunities that we see in sustainability, but really excited um, to be here with all of you. Great, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Jamie Ridgely. My husband and I and our three daughters and a very brand new son-in-law uh, farm in North Central Iowa. I have really spent my career um, in kind of the intersection in soil and water conservation, or today what we call sustainability, um, and also ag technology. 
Um, about six months ago, I left um, Truterra, the, land, the sustainability business at Land O'Lakes, and came back to the startup world. And I'm now leading product and operations at Habitair, and really excited to be back in that startup space really uh, excited about some of the things our advanced technology can do from a program development um, standpoint and, and the impact that we can have. Um, Habitair is advanced technology, it's science and modeling technology. Um, the label, I guess, for the platform and the use of our technology is uh, what we call in this space an MMRV, or a measurement, monitoring, and verification platform, which is a lot of words that means we measure the environmental outcome of crop production. Um, and uh, we do that with some really unique technology that was actually developed here by Dr. Caillou Guam's lab at uh, UIUC. So that's pretty exciting and that we have exclusive license to develop that technology. And so I'm excited to share with you some of the things that we're able to do with that and how we really think it's gonna revolutionize uh, the marketplace, uh, particularly in ecosystem services, but particularly in the greenhouse gas. Great, uh, great to see uh, you all. Thanks for the time. Uh, Alexi Rostopshov, I lead our sustainability solutions team within John Deere. Um, and just uh, laying out a bit of how John Deere thinks about sustainability. Uh, and the fundamental principles are really that profitability and sustainability are not in conflict. In fact, they're very much interlinked and complementary. Uh, and so when we actually updated our uh, corporate goals a few years ago, they weren't separate sustainability goals and strategic goals. They're, they're, they're rolled into one. Uh, and some examples of that are around uh, improving nitrogen use efficiency or reducing pesticide use because when you're able to do more with less, that's much better for the, for the producer's bottom line. And we view our role as uh, giving producers the tools that they need uh, to actually implement uh, these new technologies, these new uh, farming practices, if they, if they so choose, and to understand the impacts uh, that, that these, uh, uh, you know, that their operations have. So it's really equipping them and their trusted advisors uh, to make those, those decisions that, you know, might be right for one farm, but m might not be right for, for another farm. Uh, so, you know, one, one last thing I would just say is, our group uh, is, is cross-functional, but we are based in the technology uh, part of the organization, so that's a testament to, uh, I would say again, the linkage that we see between uh, technology being, being an enabler here um, as, as something that can mo really move the needle and make it easy for, or easier for farmers uh, to uh, understand and adopt some of, these, um, some of these things as we think about all the challenges uh, going forward. Thank you. And Charlie, I want to come back to you and talk about biotech solutions that help farmers use land, water, and energy more sustainably, and uh, what are the most significant breakthroughs that Bayer has in this area? Yeah, not only biotech, but just innovation in general. I, I think we have a lot of opportunity. When I think about regenerative ag, the technology is really an enabler for it. Um, Within Bayer, you're going to hear a lot more from us moving, pivoting away from sustainability in general towards regenerative ag and regenerative ag systems. And when I think about regenerative ag, it means producing more, making sure the farmer's more profitable, otherwise it won't stick, and then having a positive environmental or social outcome. And a good example of, of the technology I'll use today is an innovation in corn, um, which we call the Presion corn system. And what that is is a short stature corn that's been developed that has deeper roots, so there's opportunities there for carbon sequestration. It stays shorter than normal corn for about a week longer, so that gives you the opportunity to pull an anhydrous toolbar across corn that you wouldn't be able to do at the same stage. And then there's in-season management potential, not only for crop protection products, but also, just down the road from here, we have a protocol where we've seeded cover crops in the, in the corn before harvest. So that's just one example of, of an innovation where we think we can deliver value. Thank you. Samita, what criteria do you use to evaluate potential sustainability impacts of the startups that you choose uh, to invest in within the food and ag sector? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, the impact and sustainability of our investments, that really is something that underpins everything that we do. So 
sustainability and whether that's positive impacts on the environment or human health is really kind of that first screening criteria. And we really think about, you know, can we look at frameworks like the UN Sustainable Development Goals or other leading impact measurement and management uh, frameworks to really assess the impact potential of our investments. Um, but that's kind of just step one. I think for us it's really important to think about how do we um, prove out the business case for investing in sustainability and really show that to other investors and the industry at large to show that this is really um, you know, an investable opportunity. And that really starts with building really strong, resilient businesses. So kind of moving after we've established that this has a sustainability impact, we really look at, you know, is this a great technology? Is it protectable? Does it have IP at play? Um, is it something that came out of university or a strong research history? After that, what is the use case? What is the value proposition to end customers or to the grower? What is this actually going to look like um, to deliver value? And what does that mean in terms of unit economics? Um, what is the path to market? So how does this product and technology actually commercialize, whether that's um, we've seen, you know, in the early days of ag tech, a lot of people were trying to go direct to the farmer and that doesn't tend to work very well. Um, so how do we think about playing with existing channels and ways that growers are operating today? Um, and then finally thinking about, you know, what does the founding team look like? What is their expertise? What is their ability to actually lead and grow and scale this business to uh, move towards an eventual exit? Thank you. <clears throat> Jamie, you started to tell us a little bit more about uh, how Habitera provides solutions uh, in this area. Would you like to say some more about that? Sure. So <clears throat> there's really two, uh, I'd say, key uses of the Habitera technology. Uh, one is for decision support. And so we want to be able to use that technology and deploy it with partners to help farmers make the best decisions they can about the sustainability impact. So one example of that may be easily accessible tools for a grower to be able to understand the carbon intensity of the grain that they're producing uh, and understand, you know, if, if they change something in their management, what would be the impact of that? So working through uh, what we call channel partners, we work with channel partners both on the upstream side and the downstream side. Uh, it's really important to us that we can really focus on that best in class science and modeling technology. Uh, and so we really have chosen kind of a narrow slice of the market. So we do that quantification piece, and let the channel partner work uh, either with the upstream grower or trusted advisor um, or on the downstream side with the, uh, the ag value chain company who is wanting to understand uh, the footprint of their supply shed. So that's one way that the technology can be used uh, is for better farmer decision making. And then of course the other one is just the quantification of that environmental outcome. The key market that we are using that for and deploying it and seeing the most demand in now is for greenhouse gases, but very quickly as we work with companies, they're very interested in also understanding the broader environmental impact um, of the crops that they're procuring. So whether that be the water quality impact, um, soil erosion, nutrient loss, those kinds of things um, are really, we're really seeing a lot of interest in that as well. And the modeling technology that we use does look broadly at ecosystem impact, so that's a large growth area for us as well. Thank you. Uh, Alexi, uh, John Deere makes equipment and digital technologies that help uh, in the production process. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how these sustainability aspects connect to the OEMs in the relationship with the farmer? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably dive into the digital aspect of it, but um, uh, a little bit more in, in a bit here. But that, that is a core element of making these uh, technologies easy for customers, uh, growers to, to adopt. Um, but as we think about uh, maybe the more traditional way in which people uh, think about John Deere as equipment and equipment and technology on the farm, uh, we really look at uh, our, a production system approach. So as we think about the entire system, what are the tools and technologies we can give our customers across each of those steps to again do, you know, accomplish more uh, you know, with less to be more profitable and more, more sustainable in, in whatever way works for them. So you know, some examples and some of these were just announced at Commodity uh, Classic the other week uh, that fall into each of those production steps is during planting there's a technology called Exact Shot which just uh, targets the, the seed during planting to reduce uh, infer fertilizer use by 60% during planting. So if you, if you multiply that out across acres across the, you know, the US and the globe, that's a, that's a massive impact, right? And guess what? You're spending less on inputs, which is good for the bottom line. 
when we shift to thinking about uh, spraying and, and protection steps, you know, most folks probably heard about CN Spray by this point. This is a product that, uh, that has been under development for a number of years, and we, we launched uh, last year that reduces uh, pesticide use by two-thirds without having, by, by specifically targeting the weed, so you're not actually, uh, you have the same effect, but with less, uh, less chemical going out into the field, and, and we surpassed one million acres in, in adoption uh, on, on that. And then finally, uh, and this was a, a, a theme at um, Commodity Classic, is we, we announced a new harvester, which is 20% more productive, right? So if you think about uh, the impact that that has across you know, 200 plus uh, million acres of, of farmland in the U.S., all of a sudden, if you're talking about a, uh, you know, it, it, it might feel counterintuitive that an equipment company is saying, hey, you need fewer combines, but uh, that, that's part of the, uh, the way we look at it is how can we help our, our growers, our customers uh, be, be more productive. Uh, and so if we're able to Im improve the productivity of our piece of equipment uh, to be more productive, to be smarter, and actually self-calibrate settings during harvest, so fewer, you know, grains are, uh, excuse me, fewer grain is left on the field, uh, that's a huge, huge win at, at scale. Uh, so that's really how we, we think about it uh, across each of those steps. And of course, I would say that there's a digital umbrella and connectivity umbrella across all of that, especially as we move into autonomy to unlock the next, uh, the next layer of uh, productivity and efficiency for, for growers. Thank you. <clears throat> I think for the next round, why don't we talk about some of the challenges in sustainability. And uh, Samita, maybe if when, you, when we get to you, uh, you can talk about uh, uh, the criteria for really interesting sustainability from portfolio of companies or, or something along those lines. So Charlie, we'll start with you. Can, can you repeat the... So, what are some of the big challenges, challenges uh, from, yeah, the, I, from achieving sustainability? When I, think, when I go out and talk to growers about adopting cover crops or no-till um, for various programs, it, it, it's all about, to me, it's going back to my, my, if I went back to my family farm and tried to convince my uncles to, to do this with me, it's all about managing risk. So even if you, even new technologies that Bear launches every year, there's an element of risk tied to that new product because there's some unknowns. So I think whatever we can do to help farmers get overcome that risk, whether it's cost share with the programs, understanding what's going on locally on their farms, I very, I very much believe that sustainability is local. Every farm is unique, every farm is different. One solution that might work in one geography may not work in another. So being able to handhold, to test and learn, work alongside growers to learn as much as we can, I think is where we need to be. Um, uh, maybe to chime in a little bit here about some of the areas that I mentioned earlier and, and challenges within them. So if I think about the novel input space and um, you know biologics, biostimulants, I think this is a space that has gotten really hot over the past uh, year or two. Um, you know, many incumbents are leaning into this space as well, and we see a ton of opportunity and, and market growth here. But some of the challenges are just developing new regulatory frameworks and trying to figure out how to actually bring these products to market. Um, so as an example, the RNA-based technology that I mentioned um, just received uh, the first EPA registration for that, which is really exciting and, and many years in the making, um, but something that you, know, you have to think about when bringing new types of products to market. Um, education is also a really key piece here. So um, as the products come to market, it's not just the channels, but it's the PCAs, it's who are the trusted advisors to the grower um, to really influence and convince to, to scale these products. Um, so that's kind of on the input side. I think on the digital ag side, we have heard time and time again, there are so many point solutions. How do we actually integrate these and think about interoperability and really, again, reducing the burden on the producer to actually adopt these technologies because the data that's coming out of these solutions is uh, truly critical for the value chain to meet its sustainability objectives and um, the growers are really the key piece of that. And then on the last side, I think, um, again, just finding financial and risk management tools that actually work for these new types of products and practices is just something that really doesn't exist today. So I would say that's um, really both a challenge and an opportunity, but we're starting to have some really exciting conversations with um, lenders in the space, reinsurance providers, folks who are really thinking about how do institutions play a role in making it easier for growers to transition to more sustainable practices for those products to get to market and then for you know the value chain to actually get them to consumers. 
Well, I would certainly, you know, definitely echo uh, both of what these two said. Um, I think there's there's so many challenges to really transitioning the food system. So there's we could take a very we could have a whole day discussion on many of those different things. Um, I think the two that I would highlight that are most relevant to Habitat and our technology and something that we spend a lot of time talking about, how do we get these things right? Um, one key one is the data burden. Um, as Samita just said, the, d the data burden for these solutions on farmers or on any program developer or a downstream company who's trying to bring these things together is quite significant. Um, it's easy to say, like, look, look, Let's just bring in on all your as applied data from John Deere App Center, and it's not quite that simple. Um, there's a, a huge amount of promise in some of these technologies and how we can use them together, but it's not just that simple. It's very nuanced, and so um, there's a lot of a lot of growth opportunity there. But you know, how do we reduce that data burden on the farmer so that this market is something that they actually want to participate in, and we can drive more dollars back to the farm gate? Is something that uh, we think our technology has a, a large role to play in that space, um, and it's it's just something that's really important to us as a central mission um, and of Habitat and, and vision for what the technology can do. Um, I think the other thing that's really critical in terms of building an ecosystem marketplace, um, which is one of the things, of course, that we hope to enable with the Habitat technology, uh, is that there's just a large amount of variability. And so we talk a lot about how do we balance the rigor of environmental measurement and the science required to do that and then scale. And so there's a lot that goes into that conversation, but I think it's really critical for us to continue to talk about it as an industry and get that right um, so that we're not in a position to be greenwashing or putting uh, downstream companies at undue risk for the claims that they're making but also that we don't over-engineer it so much that there's no money to get back to the farmer to actually pay for the practice change and create the incentive to make these changes on the farm because they do come with significant risk. So those are the two I would highlight. You know, I think this is a simple but very loaded statement in that it needs to work for the grower. And it needs to work for others across the supply chain and yes, you know, that needs to work, but if it doesn't work for the grower, it doesn't matter. And it's a huge lift of all the, all the things that everybody mentioned here to make it work for the grower. It has to economically make sense when, you know, if you're taking on a risk that could be a $200 an acre risk and you're getting paid 10 bucks an acre for it, uh, okay, like that's, that's an interesting uh, potential uh, math uh, equation there. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also asking, I think, uh, you know, to Jamie's point, we're asking growers to start thinking about, or the industry in general is asking growers to start, start thinking about new things that haven't been a factor before. So when you're talking about things like, hey, look, great, there's billions of dollars flowing in through uh, you know, tax incentives for carbon intensity of biofuel, uh, well, great, like when, you know, have growers been thinking about carbon intensity for the last hundred years? No, they've been thinking about bushels and productivity. Um, and so we need to make sure we connect those uh, new concepts into their existing decision making and into their workflow with the partners out there that they're working uh, on today uh, on, on these issues. Uh, and that, you know, this is something that we've uh, frankly been uh, working through for decades with, with technology where you know, growers are sold on it, uh, they love it, they buy it, and then you know, a dealer follows up with them a year later, like, hey, have you used it? It's like, well, no, like, I needed to get planting into the ground. And, and I, I've personally experienced this as somebody who's more from the tech side of the equation that came into agriculture. You know, I, the first time I sat on a piece of equipment, I was like, I can't drive this. Like, you guys just gave me like a $500,000 piece of equipment and gave me the keys and I can't figure out what buttons to press. Um, and so we, we've, we've gone a long way in uh, improving uh, you know, or reducing the friction by improving our, our user experience. Uh, you see that with a lot of the recent updates in, you know, in, in cab and in the, in the digital sphere. Um, and we're just talking about you know, their, their existing farming operations, right? So when we're asking them to do something new or something different, that comes with its own uh, additional friction point. So uh, I think that's you know, what it boils down to. It has to work for the grower. We're getting to a point where we will uh, invite people in the audience to, to ask questions so you can see the microphones, but to, to get ready, you can go ahead and get ready for that, but uh, 
We're going to start with one. I'm going to give one more question that each of you can weigh in on. Um, a lot of this, uh, the talk of sustainability, we, we've been kind of going around the fringes of uh, uh, some of the things that people are thinking about scope emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three. And scope three is really thinking about how you impact the users of the products that, that companies make. And so I, I, my question is related to uh, how do the digital technologies or technologies you work in your company or precision agriculture make this the right time to be able to look at sustainability versus you know, why weren't we doing this 30 years ago? You can start. So excited to answer you can, that. Anyone, can I go first? <laughs> yes. Um, so as I mentioned, my career has been in sustainable agriculture, but I would call it soil and water conservation. And like, since I was out of college, I was always like, oh, like, sustainability is coming. This is going to be our moment for soil and water conservation. Um, and I think what we have seen and experienced in the last five years is that this is really real now in the private sector. Um, Yes, it is motivated by climate change and all of the scope three uh, science-based targets that we see the company setting. Uh, it's still very much voluntary, but it's very real and it's here to stay. So I think for me, one of the most exciting things to see is uh, we're starting to see all these resources from private sector companies merging with people who have been working in soil and water conservation for a really long time in the public sector and academia um, and all of these sectors. And so now we're getting to the point where we're starting to talk the same language. And I think we're going to see some real true innovation happen. And that's really just very, very exciting. So um, that's kind of what I'm seeing come together. And then what it's meaning is we can do what Alexi was just saying in terms of we're starting to see how can we use the existing infrastructure that we have in agriculture to enable sustainability and a transformation of our food system, where we used to kind of be like a niche group that was working over here, and we had big agriculture working over here, and then we had some, you know, maybe nonprofits working over here. We're starting to put all of those things together now, and I think that's pretty exciting. Would anyone like to add to that? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I think we're going to see a renaissance in terms of digital agriculture and data availability. You know, if, if I reflect on the conversation this morning about yield monitors, I know my family was early tech, early adopter of Yield Monitor and the Climate Corporation software to help us make better decisions on farm. And I think that's what we're going to have in the sustainability space is to be able to measure on farm outcomes and then make better decisions around management to improve those outcomes. I think one important thing to note is sustainability isn't a new concept, right? Farmers have been thinking about it for, for generations, uh, maybe not in the same terminology, but at the end of the day, it's about preserving the land and, and you know, productivity for future generations because you know, if, if you're not able to pay the bills, you're not gonna have a farm to pass on to produce in the future, right? And I think every, every farmer is, is aware of that. Um, and I, I think what, what's, what's different now is that the technology capabilities have come to a point where now we're actually able to start having the conversations. And you know, just one example in, in Op Center, right? You're using Operation Center, which is our, our di digital platform, uh, to farm and plan your operations, and you're able to document what's. I know we're working on you know making the as applied data better, Jamie. But um, you know, one of the things that you know, we're, we're unveiling is like, hey, click over here and you're able to immediately see what programs can you participate in, what is your carbon intensity score, right? Like, you don't need to go through 50 different steps uh, to figure out, you know, some of these, you know, new ways of talking about it. So I think the technology is, is, is just uh, enabling us to uh, do even more now. Maybe to uh, round us out here, I think all these are really great perspectives. I think um, thinking about our perspective as investors, we have a really unique vantage point to really see uh, across all of these stakeholders. So I think from a technology perspective, to your point, we're just we're seeing really strong technologies that have really figured out what is the use case, what is the value proposition, and how do the economics work. We're seeing corporates that are really interested in open to partnerships and collaborations, both with each other and with emerging businesses. Um, we're seeing capital flow into the space, both from you know private capital, but also government funding and new incentive structures there. So it's really just an interesting and exciting kind of uh, coalescence here for sustainability. Thank you to all of you. Some questions. 
Okay. There you go. Feel free to make your way to the microphones, but I do have a question from Lori who wants to know if you could speak more to the risks um, to user adoption besides just the cost of the, the product or the purchase. For instance, what are some other barriers to adoption? I think I, I may have mentioned the, uh, some risks around adoption of, of no-till and cover crops. And so if you've never used a cover crop before, they can be a steep learning curve. And, and I know we've all attended the seminars and opportunities out there to, to learn more about cover crop adoption, but if they're mismanaged, you can really have a, a train wreck in front of you. So I think it's just hand-holding with growers, working with them step-by-step step on what are the best management practices, what are some easy cover crops to get started with instead of jumping right in with a, a seven-way mixture of some sort, what are some of the tips of the trade in terms of the adoption so you can manage for the best experience. You know, it, it always start small. We don't want them to move to the whole farm if this is their first time in, into the practice. And I think that goes for really any new adoption of technology. Sure. Um, Jared would like to know, feel free to answer, there's a few questions in here, so feel free to answer okay. e either part of this. But um, how would you define regenerative agriculture or how do your organizations define it and what's the structure uh, to invest in it and how do you me measure success? Okay. I think I mentioned earlier our pillars for regenerative ag. So it's, it's more profitability, more productivity, and a positive environmental outcome. And within that positive environmental outcome, we're looking for improvements in soil health, water quality, greenhouse gas, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission avoidance, uh, carbon sequestration, and then working with a grower to maybe connect them with a downstream value player to, to extract more value. On here, um, so I think the way that we're thinking about it today is that and the way the industry has largely thought about it to date is as um, a set of practices that look very different in every farm, in every geography, in every crop. But we see a lot of opportunity for the industry to really move towards an outcomes-based approach that's enabled by really innovative technologies and, and thinking about how do we understand, you know, what does success look like in regenerative agriculture for the farmer, for the soil, um, and for the value chain at large. Either of you guys would like to chime in, that's fine. Otherwise, we have another question. Get a few more. So some of the, for example, regenerative grazing practices require significant more labor in terms of moving cattle more often. That is sometimes also true for uh, other regenerative, regenerative agriculture practices. How can, what, what is your perspective in to dealing with the increased labor demand to execute those practices in the middle of a significant labor scarcity in rural areas. I can kick it off here. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're on a journey towards and there's real equipment running autonomously in the field today, right? You know, we're worried, I don't know the exact uh, statistics off the top of my head, but we very much know that the ratio of people working in agriculture has decreased over time as output has increased dramatically, right, compared to, uh, you know, 100 years ago or even decades ago. Uh, and we're acutely aware of the challenges that growers face. And, and some of these, you know, if we get into the nitty gritty of it, forget, you know, changing practices, even operating today efficiently, when you're saying, oh, you know, yeah, uh, bring the crop in and then like add on this cover crop, well, you have maybe you know hundreds of other acres of crop to get out of the ground before the frost comes in and so when you're saying oh just you know throw some seed on the ground that's operationally you know next to impossible um, and likewise with split nitrogen application even right like that's a that's a big lever right but you know there's a labor issue uh, or, or risk there so as we think about giving growers superpowers right the intermediate step is is automation right you're you're still in the equipment you're uh, but you're able to squeeze more in terms of productivity. As you look ahead, the grower and operator doesn't have to be in there, right? You could have one person at a command center, right, monitoring multiple pieces of autonomous equipment. Um, and so that's, that's a journey that, that we're on, um, again, with uh, already you know, equipment in the field and, and lots more to come. 
labor is a real challenge in agriculture. I, I can't wait for the autonomous green cart. Um, that, that will be a, a big step forward. If you think about hiring someone that's going to be responsible for driving a half million dollar machine, um, you know, that, that, that feels a little risky. So I, I think um, the, the autonomous piece is coming. I can't wait for swarms and robots to, be, to apply crop protection products and fertilizers. Um, I, I, th I think that's our future. One more. Um, this is more geared towards Sumida. Um, and Moasm um, references, you know, the rapid advancements in machine learning and Internet of Things technologies and, and their applications in precision ag. And the question is, how do you see venture capital driving these adoptions um, in areas that may be less technologically advanced? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So maybe taking it in two parts. I do think we see a lot of um, you know, devices and sensors, IoT enabled things coming to market to provide in field data. So for example, we're invested in a company called Arable that is a sensor that goes in your field and can really monitor you know, weather conditions, plant data. They're starting to do really interesting applications within uh, irrigation optimization. So that's one space. But I think to the other point, thinking about um, maybe less traditional use cases, we work with a company called Swarm Engineering that is really thinking about essentially optimizing really hard problems and using AI and machine learning to do that. So as a use case, for example, um, in Latin America, how do you actually put in this problem and define it into what they call their challenge modeler of there's a bunch of laborers, they're taking buses, they're on different schedules, what growers should be in which fields at which time to really optimize you know, production, yield, and productivity um, in a world of labor challenges. Maybe I would just add to that, right? It's not just, you know, a key headline that pops out to me from that is making sense of the data. There's a bit of data overload, right? It's like, oh great, like here's another thing for you to think about. And it's like, okay, I have enough to think about in just the things I know. Now you're like giving me another data stream. Um, I, I think that's a core element of it is, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility of like, hey, like we gotta actually make the data useful for for growers and, and uh, you know, help them with the, you know, sense, decide, act, decision loop. Okay, I think we've reached the end of our time. Uh, actually, our final comments have been really kind of in the area of how this is becoming a more integrated, complex system of systems and uh, in the connectivity of all of it is really going to be on course for the journey of sustainability. Thank you to the audience for your questions and let's give thanks to the panel. Oh yes, just one more uh, plug. Uh, I'm, I'm, they, they introduced me as the executive director of the Center for Digital Agriculture, and we have a conference in this hotel tomorrow. And uh, if you want to really hear about topics of uh, circularity and sustainability in agriculture at a deeper and higher level, more of the great things that we've heard from this panel, uh, and also some autonomous vehicles, then uh, please uh, check us out tomorrow. Thank you. Uh -huh.